Welcome to Move Your Mind. My name is Nick Brax, and this is a podcast where we have real conversations with real people and give real advice. The mind can be incredibly difficult to manage, whether it's overcoming an addiction, trying to optimize your performance, trying to just get on top of daily tasks, or simply find peace of mind. It can be really difficult. TJ Power is a neuroscientist, a mind consultant, founder of Digital Mind, co-founder of me and director of mental health at Whitecomb. TJ began his professional journey lecturing in psychology at the University of Exeter. After years of deeply researching the origins of this alteration in our society's mental health, TJ left the world of academia to build Digital Mind and began teaching thousands of people how to best navigate our fast-changing world. TJ had some really great insights into practical things we can do to get the most out of ourselves and how we can overcome different obstacles that the world throws at us. Highly recommend you tune into this interview. And once again, thanks to everyone for supporting us week in, week out. We can't do it without you. And if you'd like to learn more, you can join the Move Your Mind community at moveyourmind.me and you can purchase the Move Your Mind book at nickbrax.com slash book. TJ, thanks for coming on the podcast, mate. It's great to meet you. And I say this uh, most of the time when I do these interviews, but I think my favorite part about doing this is I, I just get to have these kind of conversations with people from all over the world. So it's great to, you know, be connecting with you in, in London while I'm in New York and um, having another, you know, conversation with a like-minded person. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, excited to be here. I love these conversations. So I'm looking forward to whatever we're going to chat about. Definitely, mate. Well, I think um, before we get into it, can you give uh, just a bit of a background on yourself and how you got to where you are now? It would just be great for our audience to be able to sort of hear a bit about your story and, and who you are. Yeah, so name is TJ and by profession work as a neuroscientist. I've spent my time studying and researching the brain and all the different chemicals that impact our mental health. And I'm also the founder of a company called Digital Mind, which basically runs mental health training experiences in companies. And now we also do them in schools with students as well that take people through really understanding how the modern world is kind of affecting their mental health and provide a nice formula as to what people could do to get themselves into a much better headspace. Yeah, very cool. And what got you into what got you interested in getting going down this path, getting into neuroscience in this area? Yeah, so I always had quite a fascination with psychology in general. I played a lot of golf when I was a kid. The original dream was to be the next Tiger Woods, which didn't uh, didn't come off. So it meant that I experienced lots of sports psychology performance stuff when I was young, which got me kind of interested in this area. And then chose to study psychology at university and just really connected with it for the first time, like the first subject in my life that I really, really liked and found interesting. And then got offered the chance to begin lecturing at university. So started speaking about this topic and speaking on neuroscience whilst I was studying it. And that kind of kicked off the path to where I'm at now. That led you going down that path. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so neuroscience, what, what exactly does that involve? Can you yeah, tell me more about that? Yeah, so the area, neuroscience is obviously a big topic. It's the study of the whole brain and nervous system yeah. and all these different things. I've really niched into the, the four main brain chemicals that basically impact the experience we're having in our mind. You've got the dopamine, which is like the big famous one. Then you've got oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. And I spend a lot of time kind of studying and researching these chemicals, and then now I spend a lot of time teaching about them, how they work, these kind of things. Yeah, very cool, very cool. And so you were saying, talking to you before, you, you were saying sort of the last 18 months, two years, you've transitioned from um, the work you were doing lecturing into now starting your own, your own business. So how's that transition been and um, what are you, what, what's the work you're doing now? Yeah, so I found it quite a fun transition, to be fair. I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family. I've got mum and dad are entrepreneurs, sisters and entrepreneurs. So I kind of always imagined I'd be on some kind of path to build something. And it's been exciting. We've had maybe about 10,000 staff come through these training experiences in the last 16 months or so, which has been really fun, like learning much more about people and 
getting very comfortable with public speaking, which has been fun. It's not something I was actually just naturally into being a public speaker. So I had to get used to standing on stage and chatting about these things. And I love the whole process of building a business, to be honest. I find it fascinating connecting with teams and training people and working with other employees and all these things. So, yeah, it's been a good time. Yeah, that's great because, I mean, it's, it's definitely a sort of 24-7 thing, I guess. There's never never a point where there's not something that you can do and something that you need to think about. So it's, it's probably a transition, but um, I think that's, that's pretty important that, yeah, you, if, you, if you're loving what you're doing with it, and the process of it, then it makes it a lot easier. For sure, for sure. It is, it is very much on your mind all the time when you're running a business, but I find, it, yeah, I find it quite interesting. Sometimes you get tired and I just let myself rest and watch movies and just forget about things for periods of time. <laughs> but uh, most <laughs> of the time I find it pretty fun. Yeah, which is important. And have you seen, in since you've started doing that, have you seen there being... Um, a, a need for mental health related services in in the corporate world and um are there is, is it a, is it problematic in employees is it something that you know I, I know burnout is for example is a a huge topic and seems to be probably getting worse and worse with you know the way the world is now with technology and the fact that we live in this 24 7 world and i guess we haven't traditionally been taught you know how to how to really be self-aware and disciplined in how we look at, look after ourselves and implement, you know, habits and things like that. Are, are they some of the things you see in, in the work you do? Yeah, definitely. So I do think there's a, there's a monster requirement for this now. I think COVID drastically changed society in many ways. And one of those was the mind, I think, is finding the way in which we live our lives quite difficult. COVID drastically altered our relationship with our tech and our phones and, I'm someone that's very techy. I love my phone. I love social media, all these things. But also from the neuroscience yeah. part of me, I know that it's very challenging for our brain, the amount of stimulation and pleasure and all of these different things that are occurring as a result. So, yeah, burnout is a big topic. Inability to focus is a massive topic, like really actually struggling to be productive because often our attention spans are struggling. Low mood is a big thing. Anxiety is a big topic. So, yeah, I think... Many people in our world, I think for a long time, mental health was something that was like quite a small percentage and like people were having a really, really tough time with it, which is, of course, an area that we aim to treat with the training experiences. But I think rather than it just being like a small percentage, I think many people now are just having like a relatively tough time in their head, not like super difficult clinical anxiety and depression, but just not feeling that good, struggling with their energy, feeling like yeah. nervous and anxious in their head, that kind of thing. So the idea is that the training experiences will enable people to, to move themselves out of those headspaces. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, how big of a problem do you think that is with, I guess the fact that, you know, we can't focus as well these days we are. Um, I mean, I, I notice it in myself a lot of the time and I'm trying to use social media to promote the things that I'm doing, but I'll be scrolling through Instagram. You know, you're looking at TikTok, you're looking through all these little clips that go for, you know, five seconds and you're just going boom, 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 boom. And I'll be sitting there thinking, this is not good for me. Why am I doing this? And you just keep going. And it just can't be good. Like, mm -hmm. like you were saying before, our brains, our brains aren't built to be used that way. Like I, I think we don't probably don't even properly know the implication of all of this because it's just so new. But I mean, what's your, yeah. How, how, how bad do you think it is if it's not managed, like in terms of what it does to us? I think it's very, very significant. The, uh, it seems like it wouldn't be that big a deal, like, oh, just fast pleasure videos hitting our brain. But our brain is just constructed in a very specific way with dopamine. And there's really not that much difference between how alcohol or junk food or porn or cocaine or nicotine affects the brain in comparison to what social media does, and especially this fast-paced TikTok-style content. And... Yeah, we're very much just exhausting this dopamine receptor and low dopamine is often characterized by an inability to focus and an anxiousness in the body and low mood and these kind of experiences. So 
it is something that like we have to as a society figure out how to spend less time doing effectively while simultaneously the apps want us to spend our whole life on them so it's a pretty tricky conundrum but one that i think we will figure yeah. out in time yeah and and that that basically which i think it's a misconception it's basically a lot of these pathways and patterns that we form through things like social media and you know a range of other things whether it's addiction to work or anything really um we're sort of taught that addiction is just someone who's you know an alcoholic or drug abuse or those you know key areas but i think there's that conversation that needs to be had and that, that education that it's actually you know the the vehicle of what it is is it, it could be a range of things and it's but it's actually the outcome is pretty similar obviously some are going to be worse but still you know forming these addictive habits is happening all around us and mm-hmm. a lot of us aren't aware of it and you know if you're not aware of it you, how, how can you even begin to address trying to to make a change in that area i think it's yeah very well put and I think the, the addiction word is such like a powerful word that many people would never associate themselves with being an addict. Of course, those that are actual addicts would. But I really believe that everyone, I yeah. mean, I've, I've trained lots of people. Everyone's addicted to something in our modern world. Everyone's, it could be like bad food. It could be porn. It could be gambling. It could be the social media. It could be booze. It could be, and probably is yeah. most of them, to be honest. And, uh, our brains really don't like to experience tons and tons of dopamine and they just get so exhausted by the experience of so much pleasure and pain and pleasure work in this like opposing balance. So we're actually designed evolutionarily and biologically to actually experience a bit of pain in order to earn pleasure. So if you imagine something like hunting down an animal or building some shelter or the effort of raising your children, these kind of things are quite a lot of effort to do but then pleasure would come after and when we have things that are fast pleasure straight away mm. the dopamine basically depletes down and that's what leaves many of us feeling pretty crap yeah it's interesting and it so it's how, how can we how, you know how are we meant to manage that when when it's just so integrated into daily life i think it's like you know you wake up in the morning and you don't even have to leave your bed you open your phone and boom you know it's all happening again um, you know, how, like, I, I think the thing is it's unless you go and sort of just remove yourself from society, you're going to be exposed to this stuff. So sort of it's this balancing act of how do I, how do I function, you know, in, in this world that this is part of, but also have enough awareness about it and find that balance, you know, what's, do you have some, you know, tips, I guess, that you can give our listeners or, you know, what's your view on that? Yeah, this is definitely my mission is to figure this out because whilst it might be fun for us to go and <laughs> live off grid in a forest, it's, it's not what we're going to do. So, um, sorry, someone's just knocking on my door. Um, it's unlikely that that's going to no be stress. the case. So there are, there are some really important things. One of them is this concept I call, fo- call phone fasting. So this is having prolonged periods of time off of your phone every day in order to get the dopamine to restore. Whenever you're not doing something that's putting fast pleasure into your brain, your body is naturally restoring this dopamine molecule. It's totally responsible for your motivation. So your body will restore it through natural process. So one rule that I think is great to follow is trying to find a 60 minute window every day where you don't see your phone. So that's a great thing to do in order to restore this. So Mm -hmm. it could be, and if you're listening and you think, I really want to be mentally healthier and more focused and motivated and more excited about my life, it would be amazing if it was in the morning when you wake up. And this is something that's so hard to achieve because the the habit pattern of wake up, check the social media is, is so strong for the mass majority and was for me. I woke up for like 10 yeah. years on Instagram. And I went through this process trying to break <laughs> that habit. And how I basically did it was, Started putting my phone on airplane at night so there'd be no notifications and eventually got to the point where I was charging the phone in a different room and it, and rather than using the phone as my alarm, I'd have an iPad as an alarm that doesn't have all of the kind of like social media apps on. My iPad has no like pool for me. There's no interest in there. It's just got like Netflix and stuff. So I try and get the phone out of the bedroom and then when yeah. I wake up, 
rather than going into the phone, I'd just like wake up, splash some cold water on my face, go to the bathroom and then see if I could just do a bit of my morning routine, step outside for a walk or do some exercise or have a shower. And just it, even at the beginning when I was pushing it back five minutes before I checked the phone, it was getting better and better. And the more you can delay it, the more optimum your dopamine is in the morning. And then the less you kind of crave it because wherever your brain basically gets dopamine from mm. the first thing, it craves that direction. So if it gets it from something good, like a bit of exercise or a bit of reading or some music mm. or something good, it's going to crave for a healthier outcome. When it gets it from the social media or for many people also the vape, the vape by the bed and just hitting the vape is very common. And uh, then like your body really urges for that for the rest of the day. So that is one tip. A 60 minute phone fast each day would be great to achieve. Which is great, which it doesn't, you know, in theory sound, I mean, I know it actually is difficult. It's so difficult to do. I find it hard to do, but in theory, it doesn't sound too crazy. You know, just the first 60 minutes when you wake up and you're still going to be using it through the day. And it's not like a huge sacrifice for us to make when we, you know, are going to be able to spend as much time throughout the day as we want anyway to, to look at it. But it's, um, it's hard, easier said than done, isn't it? And if, so when you're saying, you know, your, your brain's craving this hit of dopamine, um, it's wanting to get it from the phone or whatever else it is. If So if you got up and you go and get that hit from exercise, going to the gym or something like that, is that positive or is that still depleting these, you know, dopamine levels and having a similar impact? Yeah, that's a very good question to clarify. So it definitely is positive to get it from the exercise. And dopamine just follows this really, really simple rule. If you have to put in effort to experience pleasure from something, dopamine will naturally build in a nice steady yep. way. So when you take something like exercise, you start yep. exercising and, and it doesn't necessarily feel good. You're not like, oh, it's amazing that I'm now exercising. It's so much pleasure in my brain. But gradually throughout it, you feel a little bit better and you feel that this driving energy begin to build inside you and then Towards the end, you feel quite good, and then you finish, and you're like, yes, I'm really glad I did that. And you can imagine on like a graph, the dopamine will have gone through this nice steady curve, like climbing up, good feeling, and then it will slowly come back down. So that's a great experience. You've earned the experience of pleasure. Dopamine is built in a nice way. When you have the, the social media or junk food or any, anything like this, let's stay with social media, instead of it going through this nice gentle mm -hmm. curve, just the dopamine spikes immediately. So immediately, it's tons of pleasure hitting the brain. And then... Your brain is always and your whole body is always seeking for balance. There's that whole word of homeostasis, just like everything in equilibrium. And because it spiked really high and immediately the dopamine thinks once the source is taken away, once you're not on the phone, it's like, wow, how the hell did I get up here? And it has to equally go below its baseline, below its original level, the same amount in order to get back to its middle ground. And this is the challenge. So when it's immediate pleasure, no effort, dopamine goes like this and starts fluctuating a lot, which makes us feel shit. When it goes through a steady curve because we're putting in effort to earn it, then it's much more consistent and you feel much more driven and motivated and focused and happier in your mind in those situations. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, man. And that's, um, yeah, it's interesting. And, and, you know, I think most people can can relate to that. And I know for me, like I, um, I try and exercise first thing in the morning every day whenever I can anyway because I just, it, it, it's literally night and day like the I'll wake up and my mind sort of racing. I'm not clear. I'll go and work out. And it's just like, it's like taking, like it just levels everything out. It's just sort of, I, I can't believe, you know, how much of a difference it makes just in, in what it does on, on every level. Yeah. We just, we're so biologically designed to use these bodies. We're not just like a floating head that like the tech world kind of makes it feel like we are, like we're so in our heads these days. And so many people, have such a tough time with things like overthinking now because like all of the electrical energy is just so oriented in our minds because we're doing so much with our thinking and anytime you do this stuff you get your whole energy system into the body everything just functions better it affects all the different neurotransmitters when the body mm. moves um, and it's important to know it's, so, it's not so just exercise that would be good it's anything that's effort that makes you feel good so something like waking up and tidying and organizing your workspace that's something that's effort gives you a feeling of satisfaction after cooking a healthy breakfast and doing all the chopping that kind of thing is good cold water hitting your body it's effort but you normally feel like really good afterwards anything that's slow pleasure fantastic in the morning fast pleasure doesn't really set you off on a great path 
And I guess that's why, you know, we just feel so good when, even if it's doing, you know, work that we don't enjoy doing or a task that, you know, we not we don't find fun or exciting or whatever it is, but when you do complete them and it might, it doesn't have to be, like you're saying, it's not big things. You do, you, you, you feel significantly better. I know like for, you know, anxiety for me has probably been my biggest issue. And to, to this day, you know, something I really need to manage and, um, I'll feel much more anxious if I feel like in a day that I'm not getting things done or I don't, you know, mm. know what the things are. But when I break it down to, okay, I know today I'm getting up at this time, I'm exercising, I'm, these are the work things I need to tick off. And as you start ticking them off, you, you feeling, you know, you, you literally, it, yeah, the anxiety is going down. You're feeling more at peace, more calm. And it, it just, I don't know, it's like funny that it's sort of, I think it's something a lot of us, are aware of, but we don't make a conscious enough effort to, to really be disciplined about and, um, you know, take, take control of because, because of the distractions, because of like you're talking about this addiction to wanting instant pleasure, we neglect, you know, what we probably, a lot of us know is the healthier thing for us to do. Thank you so much for supporting Move Your Mind. We're expanding the offerings of the organization and we're tailoring everything we do to suit you guys and to try and answer to all of your needs and the questions that you send in. The book is available globally. You can find all of the links at nickbrax.com slash book. And we've just released the Move Your Mind community. We've currently got a men's community group, a women's community group, a general group. We're going to be lo- loading up other groups and you can find all of the links at moveyourmind.me. This group's been created based on the needs of what we've heard and learnt throughout running Move Your Mind. And we have live events, we've got courses, we've got huge amounts of value, the ability to share information, share ideas, work in groups together to, to grow and share your learnings, to learn about different topics. You get email reminders. There's a whole lot of features in there. We're constantly updating it. And we're so excited to share it with you. You can find all of the information about it at moveyourmind.me. Definitely. And we're just very much programmed to have to put in quite a lot of effort to being a human being. Because although life in terms of survival is monumentally easier now in terms of access for, for the mass, is access to food and shelter and all these things. For hundreds of thousands of years, surviving on this planet was extremely, extremely difficult. Surviving the weather and like the uh, experience of any danger that could come your way and finding food. And so we're just wired to feel good when we are productive so that we keep being productive so that as a collective, we stay alive. And when we're in those days, like those are the days where we often feel our worst. When we know there are things to do and maybe the to-do list is so big that it's overwhelming to look at and then we begin to procrastinate. And during the procrastination, we then get like little hits of pleasure by maybe like eating a load of crap food out the fridge or scrolling the social media. And it just begins to spiral you into this difficult state. So understanding that everything's not supposed to always feel really good and really fun and hard work is actually what often makes us feel really good. That's actually one of the best things we can do. And just breaking things down, like you say, into manageable chunks where it's like, I'm going to try and do a little bit of exercise this morning and I'm going to make sure I complete these two or three tasks that I know are really important. Then I can have some chill time. That kind of productive state from a mental health point of view is just so, so much better. It's so interesting. And I think it, it, it is, it's again, so important for us all to be aware of because it, you know, I think as you mentioned, you know, obviously we, we need our core needs met. We need to make a certain level of money to be able to survive and have a quality of life. But in the world that we live in, we've been conditioned to, you know, look at what other people are doing, you know, be as capitalistic as possible, aim for, you know, what's next? How can I one up the neck, the other person? How can I get to this level? How can I do this? Which, you know, it's good to be ambitious like that, but if it's ambitious with this story that, okay, you know, I'm not in, I'm not happy right now. I'm not enjoying my life. I'm suffering. But when I finally get this promotion in my job or when I finally pay off my house or whatever the hell it is, whatever story you've told yourself or that society's put into your brain, um, you know, I'm going to finally be okay and finally can enjoy my life when I get there. And then you get it and you're like, you know, maybe for a couple of minutes, but then it's like, well, okay, what's next? And I guess that feeds into exactly what you're saying that, you know, of course, 
great to achieve it, but still it's going to be about on it, not, not on a long-term basis, on a daily basis, what are the things I'm going to do that are going to keep me at balance, you know, as you're just discussing there, which, I mean, it's stuff I've thought about, but I love the way you're talking about it because it's making, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, as I'm listening to you say that, it's really making it just simplifying, you know, in my mind, um, a lot of these concepts. Yeah, I think that's very well described. I, we know this concept as a society where you hear big actors and musicians and superstar social media people where they say, like, I've got all the way to the top and I actually, their mental health can often fall off when they reach the peak of their career because they've suddenly achieved everything they ever wanted. And there's like kind of that whole question, why? There's a chap here called Joe Wicks in England, who's like this big fitness guy. I don't know if, I don't know if he's internationally famous, but he's very famous yes. in the UK. And he did this whole like no, he he is, exercise he's thing. He's big, every, like, big everywhere now. Big everywhere. And I watched a really interesting interview with him where he talked about getting this incredible house in a place called Richmond in London, which is like a beautiful place to live in London. And he was sitting in this kitchen on like the one of the first evenings and suddenly entered like a really low state. And then he went through a really prolonged period for a few months of feeling very low. And he had achieved everything he'd ever wanted in the amazing home, beautiful wife, amazing kids, huge career, everything. And he was not feeling good. And what's super interesting, because this dopamine stuff is very, very connected with depression and mood and low dopamine is often categorized biologically as what depression actually is. And for a lot mm. of time, humans have always heard this dopamine thing and seen it as the reward chemical. You often read that on social media and you see that online. Like dopamine is the feeling of reward when you do something. But when you look at lots of research and actually you really investigate it, you actually experience the most dopamine in the pursuit of a goal, not actually achieving the goal itself. Mm. So it's actually in the moments where you're in pursuit of something that you feel your best. And you can imagine when god or evolution or whatever was putting us here stitching us together and making us humans they needed to make sure that when we were hunting down the animal and that's an extremely hard thing to do or building shelter whilst it was pouring with rain and all these things they need to make sure it felt really good for us to pursue things so that we kept doing them so that we'd remain alive and understanding that pleasure is actually in pursuit not in achievement is actually really interesting because even today for example i woke up and I'm very vulnerable to like mental challenges. It's probably a big reason I work in this space. And I just like wasn't feeling that good this morning. I went on my walk and I just didn't have my energy that I normally like having. And I thought if I just sit down, I went to a coffee shop this morning. If I just sit down and nail out some work, maybe I'll begin to feel better. There's a particular project. And during the work was when I actually began to feel better, when I was actually achieving mm. something. And it wasn't afterwards that I felt better. It was during it that I felt better. So really understanding that pursuing things is really what makes us feel good, not just achieving things. Yeah, it's such a good point. And, and you know, not, I, and again, I think, you know, that's like a positive thing if we can grasp it because we've been taught that it's, always you know about what's the end point you know what's the end game here what am i doing this for even you know even starting a company like i've been involved in different startups and in that world and it's always about you know but what's your exit strategy what's this you know what are you doing it for and instead of just being able to just do something for the sake of doing it and not putting you know like like because i know i always feel so much more calm in life when it's like okay like um there's no end you know i, I pursue acting and I, I I really started enjoying it and loving that creative outlet when I just thought, you know what, like until the day I die, like there's no, there's no achievement or there's no like right or wrong or, you know, it's not this black and white thing. I'm just going to do it, keep growing, learning, creating stuff, having fun with it. You can't, there's no, there's no end to it. And that's actually quite liberating because you're like, well, okay, so I'm going to give myself permission to just do this and not really, you know, need to prove that there's this end outcome or whatever it is. So when, when you sort of really can embrace that, I guess it removes a lot of that overwhelm because exactly what you were saying, I think when you're doing the thing, you experience that, you know, that sort of peace of mind, but often it's hard to even start when mm -hmm. we're overwhelmed because we're putting so much pressure. We're thinking, oh, but, you know, I've got 20 things to do today. How am I going to do it all? 
you know, where do I begin? I can't do this. I can't cope. And you sit and ruminate rather than just being like, let's just take that first step. And as soon as you, you know, you do, you sit down. I know I've done this so many times where I'm overwhelmed. I'll sit and I'll say, okay, I'm just going to send one email. And you do that and, you know, two hours later, you're still sitting there working. You're like, oh, wow, you know, I feel significantly better right now. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, you know, going and just doing it rather than thinking so much. Definitely. And I think because that crossing that that boundary of like in the procrastinating, sitting on the sofa, scrolling TikTok state to getting to the computer, for example, is is tricky. And like, I understand all this stuff like fairly well yeah. and chat about it. And I still find myself in those situations very regularly. It's not like I'm immune to these challenges. And something I found super useful, this sounds like a plug for an app. I have no relationship with this company, but there's this app called Forest, which basically you, you go on it and it grows virtual trees and you have to basically set a timer for how long you'll not go on your phone for during that period, it will grow virtual trees and it will, then go on to like help the environment and all that stuff. But basically it just gets you off your phone ah. for long periods of time. So I will be sitting there on TikTok and like when you're in that dopamine TikTok state, you really don't want to leave it because you know it's painful to leave because your brain knows if you put the phone down, your dopamine's going to plummet and you're not going to feel good. This is why we all endlessly scroll. So what I'll do is I'll just like force myself to go onto the app, put 45 minute timer. And then I'll watch it start. And basically, if you go onto the app, you have to watch the tree die and all this BS that basically tries to put you off wanting to go on it. And then I'll go put my phone in another <laughs> room and I'll just I'll just sit down at my computer. And the beginning is always annoying because the dopamine is low because you've just been exhausting it on the phone. But as you said, you complete one email and then there's a little bit of dopamine rising in the pursuit of the garden. Then another task and you start with like some easy basic tasks and gradually build them up. And then you can like last a while, but definitely using something like forest and getting the phone away from you is just a must because otherwise you just go back and forth. My name is Nick Brax and I'm a storyteller who has dedicated my entire adult life to creating positive conversations around mental health. In recent years, discussions around mental health have become less taboo and entered the mainstream vernacular. I've delivered over 1,000 mental health seminars around the globe, including several TED Talks, and I believe we all have a story to tell. In my book, Move Your Mind, I cover my story and stories from people that inspire me, as well as insights from world-leading mental health experts. This book will help you to learn how to recognize mental health issues before they become a problem. Use your personal challenges as motivators, take ownership of your well-being, and create new daily habits that increase happiness and reduce stress. That's a super cool, super cool app. I'm, I'm going to download that. I think that, yeah, it sounds amazing. <laughs> I love that idea. Nice. Um, yeah, it's very useful. I love it. And what, 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 what about, um, th like things like ADHD, for example. So, um, you know, a lot of that's to do with, with dopamine. Do you think because of the world we live in now, is it hard to sort of, is there a fine line between knowing and, you know, how do, how do we work out where, whether someone actually has ADHD and their behavior is going down that pattern because they can't regulate the dopamine and, you know, it's, they haven't been diagnosed or whatever it is, or is it just someone not functioning properly in this, in the world? Yeah. ADHD is super interesting. And as you say, very, very connected with dopamine It's categorized by very low dopamine, which is why, Things like Adderall and ADHD style medications are dopamine based molecule medications so that the dopamine rises, which enables like you to focus on things. I think it's a it's a complicated topic because of course, like you you can naturally have ADHD, and I think many people do naturally have ADHD, but the way in which our world is constructed now is giving massive amounts of people ADHD like symptoms. And I, when I was at university, I didn't think about any of this stuff. I just went on my phone all the time. I used to drink loads of booze and all these different things. And mm. I took an ADHD test and had ADHD. And I think it's, it's good to have these diagnoses, but sometimes then you can fall into the trap of just being like, well, I've got ADHD, so I can't focus. So I, I won't bother with these kind of things. And I think 
that is a bit of a challenge because then the dopamine is only going to get worse and worse if you never begin to figure out your way to regulate it. So if you are exhibiting the experience of struggling to focus and the kind of more desire, like because you're so low in dopamine with ADHD, you crave for faster pleasure even more than the average person. But I think a huge amount can be done to alleviate that challenge. So it's tricky following these kind of ideas of prolonged periods off of fast hit dopamine. These are the ways to try and get the brain back into a bit of balance. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, a good general rule is um, if we, if you can sort of look at your day to day life and think, you know what, like I can identify a whole bunch of things that I could, you know, change and do for myself that'll make me probably make me feel significantly better before I, you know, go and seek other treatments or, you know, sort of look into other methods to, to deal with this, why don't I just try all these different things? Like, I, again, I know for myself, like, if I'll look at it, I, um, you know, often don't sleep properly or my schedule's all over the place or you're scrolling on Instagram, you're ruminating. It's like, well, if I, why don't I try and, you know, like really address a lot of these different things and then see how I feel. And then if I'm still not feeling good and coping, then maybe I go and, okay, look at what else is there. Maybe I do need treatment. Maybe it is mm -hmm. ADHD that I actually need medication for or whatever it is. But I think we, you know, we normally, because it's hard, you know, it's like not, not the easy option to go and really have the discipline to try and, and, you know, I fall victim to that as well. I think we all do, but Definitely. trying to really think, okay, what are, you know, cause I think we, again, we all know it's like, it's crazy. And I, I, I do a lot of public speaking and work in, in companies and so much of it I'll be talking about. I'm like, this is like, what I'm saying here is common sense stuff. Um, we're all aware of it, but we don't actually do it and how, because we don't, we're not taught how to implement that into our day and how to make that part of our life and, and, and work, you know, I'm sure you see in, the work you're doing with these companies, it's like, well, a lot of, a lot of what I've noticed is a lot of employers will be saying, yeah, I get it. That sounds, that's great. I want, you know, I'd love to do that, but I don't have time. You know, I've got a, I've got a family, I've got commitments outside of work. I've, you know, I don't have enough time to complete my work. I don't have any time. And, you know, so when they don't actually go and do it, which I think we, that it needs to change, you know, we need to change how we look at each day, you know, how we spend our lives. I totally agree. I totally agree. And I think sometimes with this whole mental health conversation is because it's such a big topic, there is a lot of advice in the world and there are so many great things you can do for your mental health. But I think sometimes because there's so much, it can lead to the overwhelm of, oh my God, what do I do? And then nothing occurs. Very similar to when you have loads of tasks to do and you do none of them. And I think yeah, for, from my opinion, firstly, really assessing behaviorally how are you living your life. Something like ADHD, for example, is massively connected to diet. And many of us are really spiking our sugar a lot of the time, which isn't fantastic from an ADHD perspective. Same kind of issue that happens with TikTok. So behaviorally checking things in and then really just making like adopting a mentality where I'm going to really start to experiment and be quite experimental with how I'm doing things, how I start my day or how when I'm working, how much I check my phone and then what my food looks like and just beginning to experiment and becoming quite observational of how do these behaviors affect what's going on in my head. And then you begin to get, begin to develop this more intuitive relationship with yourself. And then often you begin to make wiser decisions. So I do think mm, yeah, a huge mm. amount can be achieved. You just have to take little steps, check it out. Did it work? Did it not work? And then, and then move from that. Yeah, absolutely. No, I completely agree with that. Um, you're telling me about a, you've got a bit of a process uh, um, that you follow for the, the work you do with your company um, and with organizations. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, so this is, this is the process I do with them, but in general, this is the process I'm constantly doing on myself and anyone listening can easily like follow this model. Um, so this is what I call dose. And when you look at these four neurotransmitters, very fortunately, when you look down the side, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, it spells dose down the side. And each of them for one reason or another isn't perfectly in alignment, basically, with the way in which we're living our modern world. And 
it just the the model basically takes you through understanding like why do we have this chemical like what's the point of it because obviously it's there for a very important reason and then what does it kind of look like if it's out of balance how might you be feeling if it's out of balance obviously we've talked quite a lot about dopamine just now so we'd have some perspective on that and then what are some really key behaviors that you require as a human being in order to optimize the chemical balance of that chosen neurotransmitter? So that's kind of the model that I guide people through. Mm. That's really cool. No, I, I really like that because I think one of the big problems is, you know, there's, there's a lot of awareness now, uh, which is great. You know, people are more open to it. We're talking about mental health. Um, there's a million things out there. There's apps, there's content, there's, you know, more mindfulness apps than I can probably count. Um, <laughs> but it can create an overwhelm in itself because because it can be, it's like, okay, you know, like where do I begin? What do I do? What do I use? Okay, I've found something I want to use. Now um, it can often become almost too much pressure on that, you know, that thing where it becomes an overwhelming thing in itself. You're putting, you know, okay, I need, need to meditate, exercise, do all these different things every day. If I don't do it, okay, I'm not going to be hitting my mark. But I think what you're saying with that model, if it's more looking at it on a scientific level, it's not as overwhelming because it's more about just, okay, am I getting enough of this? Okay, dopamine. Okay, what can I change? All right, I'm scrolling too much. How do I lower that a little bit? How do I do this? Rather, than, So then it becomes less about, okay, I've got to just load my day with, you know, more objectives, more things where you're so overwhelmed, you you know, you don't stick to any of them. Um, I think it, yeah, I don't know. I just think it like, it, it really simplifies the process. Have you found that with, with people that you've, you, you work with, does it, does it have that effect? Yeah. It's interesting you say that because this is a model that I, uh, I came up with this maybe April this year. So like it's relatively new teaching it in this way. I was always teaching about all of these neurotransmitters, but I just never realized that it's spelled dose down the side. And I was teaching like a, a vast range of different things, all with the intention to get certain behaviors into people's lives. But I would always think like, wow, there's a lot of decisions for people to make here. There's loads of different things for people to pick from. And I always was trying to think, how can I just simplify this mental health thing? How can I make it much more formulaic that, for example, like serotonin, that's responsible for my mood and my emotional state. What are the four behaviors that affect serotonin? I wanted it to become much more simple for people's brains. And I have definitely found that ever since delivering this model, I think it's much easier for an individual to retain the information basically. And as I said before, the absolute number one priority is learning to intuitively connect with yourself and figure out what makes you feel good. Because we, we all are very unique in terms of a human. Someone might absolutely love going on walks in nature and that really calms them and gives them a sense of peace. Whereas someone else might find the experience of cooking really really good for their head and they love chopping up vegetables and like getting really immersed with some music on so the whole process guides you to think a little bit more to be a bit more observational of how am i feeling at the moment like what kind of state am i in am i and am i low in motivation or am i feeling lonely or is my mood low or am i feeling stressed like so you have to get a bit of a distinction and then you think oh this is low and then that associates with so loneliness for example would associate mm. with oxytocin and then you think, oh, what did that geezer on that Zoom call say about oxytocin? What do I need for oxytocin? And then they'd go through some of the key behaviors. So I have found that more formulaic approach to be quite nice. No, I think that's great. And yeah, I think it makes makes so, so much sense. And, and, and you know, really, yeah, like you're saying there, just being aware of it. Like I know for me, you know, I'm living in New York at the moment, which is, you know, I'm in the middle of chaos, there's barely any nature available, um, you know, so much stimulation everywhere. And I know that I feel, you know, significantly better when I'm in nature and, you know, it's quiet and I'm in that environment. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm here at the moment. So it's sort of something where I'm like, well, it's probably long term, not a good thing for me, but you can easily fall into not actually listening to that stuff and dismissing it and, you know, going years and years without doing what's good for you. And it's, it's actually such an important thing, you know, really these things make a big, big difference and bigger than I think that we realize. Definitely. Definitely. And there are always 
a multitude of ways that you can receive these chemicals. I, as you said, ideally, it is great to be immersed in natural environments. Like, really, we all want to be living in tree houses, like with Wi-Fi. That would that would be perfect for our mental health. But we can't do that, unfortunately. We're in a more city style life as a, as a society. Um, but there are always other things that can, can affect it. So nature, for example, is great for serotonin, which is why you experience this calming of your emotional state in nature. But other factors are very significant. The, the nutritious food that goes into your body is really good for serotonin. 95% of it, of that neurotransmitter is actually built inside your gut, inside your digestive tract. So when nutritious food goes in, that actually has a very calming effect. This is why food and mood are so interconnected. Sleep and rest are really, really important. So part of the reason we love nature is because it calms our body because effectively our system goes, oh, I'm at home right now because this is where I was raised for the last 100,000 years. So it calms itself down. So Mm -hmm. if nature isn't accessible, thinking how much actual proper rest do you give yourself? Because for a lot of us, like we work really hard on the computers all day and then we finish work and we sit on the sofa and we smash TikTok for a few hours whilst also watching TV with <laughs> also trying to cook. And it's not like actual rest, whereas sometimes lying on the sofa and just like putting some music on and just lying there and letting yourself nap or letting yourself just chill, these kind of things from a serotonin mood one, those would be things that could give you some of the value that nature would give because it's actually calming the body down. Totally. Totally. I think so, so true, mate. Um, so before, before, before um, we finish every episode with five sort of key questions, quick nice. answers, that, um, whatever comes to mind, but yeah, just before I go into that, can you, what, what, what are some things you, I mean, you've touched on it, but what are some things you do yourself on a daily basis that just help, help you feel good and, you know, look after your mental and physical health? Yeah. So, First one would definitely be not checking phone when I wake up. It's vital for me. So that's the first one. Um, always getting out into natural light before like I do anything else really. So I normally wake up, like splash some cold water in my face. I go to the bathroom and then just immediately put some shorts and a top on and step outside. doesn't have to be like some big hour long walk. It could just be 10 or 15 minutes, but really important for natural light to wake the system. So that's a big one for me. Um, I really like uh, the cold water stuff. So whenever I have a shower, I have my normal shower. And then at the end, I turn the water cold, uh, take some deep breaths and just like deal with the pain. As I said before, like often pleasure is found in pain and it's really good for the dopamine system, really good for the endorphin system as well. So a bit of cold water in the shower. Uh, What else? I think a lot about my food. I think it's really important. I, uh, for example, Fruit for me is like so connected with my mental health, which seems so weird. But when I under eat fruit, I just Mm. like don't have as consistency, as much consistency with my mood. So making fruit a priority. And then of course, all the other things, lots of veg. If I have like meats and things like that, which I have less of, but having really clean grass fed meat is important to me. Uh, Napping is something I do, which is unusual given that you're supposed to be a entrepreneur hustler and never stop working but i actually don't believe that is how you optimize performance so i regularly maybe three or four of the weekdays i'd say i probably nap on the sofa for 30 minutes that's something i find important for my mental health um and then final one is actually something that's very significant that i've been doing recently is i've actually stopped drinking alcohol which has been mental Mm. for me because i'm someone that really pushed the partying game pretty hard in my uh, teenage and early 20s. Like the whole world of partying was something that's very fun to me. Could be another reason I'm in this mental health space with how kind of far I pushed my brain. And just over a month ago, I decided I'm going to see what life is like without alcohol. And I feel so good with that alcohol coming in. And I wasn't a big drink. For the last few years, I've barely drunk anything. But even just having none, I just, my weekends are so different. My mood is so different. My anxiety is so much lower. So yeah, there's a few things that I think are are helping me out a lot. No, thank you for sharing that, mate. And I think, um, I mean, I'm, I'm similar. I did a a lot of partying in, you know, back in my, in my twenties and I, I still drink now, but it's, you know, it's not not too often, but I'm, I'm thinking of doing the same thing because it's, you know, it'll be, I don't know, some weeks there might be a few nights where you just 
you know, you know you're at a different thing, you're with a friend, family, whatever, and you have a few drinks and it, it's enough to sort of make you just feel a bit off the next day and it does have an effect mm-hmm. and it's just, I mean, I think, yeah, something I'm looking into doing and a hard thing to do in, you know, the world we live in where it's just so embedded in how we socialise in our society, but I think it just can make a gigantic impact because it's all, you know, if you can feel 1% better even in in a, in a day, then why not, you know? Yeah, I because the biggest thing yeah. for me was the social life aspect and also like dating and things like that. I was thinking how would, how would life work without alcohol? Cause it's just, it's such a core part of us, our society and having more of a statement in my mind of like, I just, I just don't drink rather than like, Oh, I'll only have one or two is really helpful. Cause for a long time I've yeah. just said like, I just don't drink much anymore, but then like alcohol is a powerful drug and you have a few beers and you think let's definitely have some more of these. Cause this is feeling amazing. And I've really found like for the last month, my social life hasn't been impacted. Like I've still had really fun weekends, really fun social experiences. I've been dating girls and I had a nice time, like hanging out with them and talking and all these kind of things. So I think it's so, just as I've said many times with the experiment thing, it's so worth a try just committing to like one month without it and seeing what happens during that month. Because for example, like September's coming up and September's normally like quite a work hustle month, like the whole world, like summer ends and it's like, right, let's all get rich, basically what happens as a society in September. And I think that'd be such a good month just to see why don't I just not drink this month? Alcohol free beers are very, very good. I find them very useful because they can give me a bit of a vibe that I'm like in the mix that I'm drinking and I'm not. <laughs> and uh, I would say it's definitely exactly. worth a try. Yeah. For <laughs> it, it might be quite significant what it does to your mind. It's the 10-year anniversary of Underbrax, and we've relaunched with the classic white pair. We've also got new styles coming out super soon. We're donating a dollar from every pair to mental health, currently to one in five. You can find all of this at www.underbrax.com. Yeah, I love that. All right, so these five questions. Um, the first one is, what is the best childhood experience that comes to mind? Best childhood memory that comes to mind? uh probably building camps in a a forest there was a forest near my house when i was a kid i lived more in the nature when i was really young before i went into the city and like building and putting together camps with my friends and my brother and sister and stuff that'd probably be number one love it um what would you say is currently the biggest burden on mental health in society Social media. Definitely social media. Yeah. <laughs> I would say like, I, I think probably 95% of people that come on the podcast will say the same thing. It's, um, yeah. I think many other factors are having a big impact. I think alcohol is huge. Bad diet is huge. Lack of exercise, lack of nature. But I just think this constant stream of dopamine, but also just, all we're doing is observing other people having a good time. And it's just so tricky for our brain that because so many people now feel super lonely. And if you imagine you were at mm-hmm. school and you had to sit on the playground at break time and watch everyone have fun and you had to just sit there and observe it, you wouldn't have a very good time at school. And like effectively what we're doing on social media is just sitting and watching everyone else enjoy themselves whilst often the moments we're in it we're not necessarily doing something very fun because we're bothering to scroll social media and i just think it's creating such a confusion in our head as to whether we're enjoying our lives so yeah we got to figure out this social media thing it's pretty important (laughs) it's yeah incredibly important um what's your personal definition of happiness Wow, that's a great question. Um, feeling, feeling aligned with like the pursuit of something, I think is when I feel most happy. Like if I, if I feel like I'm in the pursuit of anything, whether it's I'm pursuing like a healthier lifestyle or like a relationship, whether it's a friendship or a relationship with someone or my work, I just feel like I'm happiest when I'm in the pursuit of something that's like a goal i think for me that would be what makes me happiest i think that's a confusing answer but that 
that is when happiness occurs for me when I'm like going no. in a certain direction when I'm not stagnant. I, I couldn't agree more on that. I think, yeah, it, 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 it's definitely makes a big difference. Uh, what are you most afraid of? What am I most afraid of? I would say the younger generation having just like a monumentally tough time in their minds and us not figuring out a solution to this. Like I, I train a lot of schools now and I go into schools yeah. and it's breaking my heart to be honest, seeing the mental state that young people are in and young years are supposed to be such a like magical experience, making friends and having fun and having no care in the world. And now it is just not that and we've got to figure out so i'd say biggest fear is us yeah, not not figuring out a viable solution for the young people yeah yeah it's, it's so true um final one what are you most proud of oh, wow what am i most proud of um I said, my ability to just continue to dig deeper and deeper into this topic, I would say, like I am just every day going further and further into my own thinking and own research and all of these different things, trying to, trying to find a solution. And I'm pretty proud of myself. I'm honest that I'm putting in this level of effort and I'm hoping it's going to be a value to people. Yeah, well, I think it's amazing, mate. I mean, you're making you're making a, a genuine difference in the world. You're doing. I mean, there's not many more important things you could be doing than what you're doing. We need this. You know, we need these conversations. We need this information. It's it's super important. And the the you know farther and wider that you can you can get it, the better. Because there's you know a lot of people really really are needing this. And I've seen that time and time again when I've gone into companies. And you know, sometimes I've gone and done a workshop or you know, you've done different things and you, you're thinking, okay, this is actually helping. And then you hear afterwards, you know, how, how it really connected with, even if it connects with only a couple of people, it's like people that wouldn't have um, made that change had maybe if you had not gone and engaged and, you know, talked about what you're doing. So it's super important and, you know, really love what you're doing and appreciate you coming on. Um, and for our listeners, uh, if they want to learn more about you and find more information, where, where can we send them? Yeah. Thanks, man, for all those kind words. The uh, best place, if you go at TJ Power, so T and then a J and then power like electricity on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, these kind of things. Instagram and TikTok are my best ones. So, yeah, TJ Power on those. And, yeah, always love new people joining the conversation. So, yeah, anyone listening, go and um, go to those links. I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, get on Instagram and TikTok, but don't stay on there for too long. Listen to what yeah, you said. So ironic. But also follow. Don't scroll all my short videos. And screw <laughs> <to me now. laughs> but, but look at some ones that are actually going to help educate us about how to regulate the dopamine, you know, just get at least more positive. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll, all of that will be in the show notes. So anyone listening, you know, definitely go, go check out um, everything that TJ is doing and, you know, go, go to the links that we put in the notes, but thank you again, mate, for coming on. Really appreciate it. Love the conversation and, um, we'll have to stay in touch. Awesome. Super grateful, mate. Love this conversation. Such great questions, man. Appreciate it, mate. Thank you. Thanks to TJ power for joining me today for move your mind. If you'd like to learn more, you can join the Move Your Mind community at moveyourmind.me. You can purchase the Move Your Mind book at nickbrax.com slash book, or you can purchase a pair of underbracks with a dollar going towards mental health. You can find that at www.underbracks.com.